Good morning. And now, Father God, as we come to consider your word, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts will be acceptable in your sight. In Jesus' name, amen. I have to say straight away that this passage of scripture makes my heart sing. In fact, the whole chapter of chapter two makes my heart sing because it's the before and after. The before Jesus and after Jesus. And it is about the Jews and the Gentiles of which I am one. And as a Gentile, I would have been excluded from the covenants, from the covenants and the promises of God at that time. The Jews and the Gentiles, like the children's talk this morning, they really did not like each other. They didn't speak to one another. They didn't sit and eat together. They didn't want to have anything to do with each other at all. In fact, in some ways, the Jews thought, I think, that they were better than the Gentiles because they had the covenants and promises of God. But they also had a great many laws. The commandments that were given to them to follow were very rigid and hard. And I must say that life in Jesus Christ is much easier now. And the passage tells us of scripture that was read that God had decided in his plan to put an end to the circumcised and the uncircumcised. And he did that by sending his own son into the world to die on a cross, to form a new covenant. You see, it wasn't when Jesus actually gave up his life on the cross, which he did willingly. When that soldier came along to break his legs and finish him off, he saw that Jesus had already died because God had promised that no bones of his body would ever be broken. So the soldier pierced his side with a spear instead. And in that moment, when Jesus' blood hit the ground, the new covenant of God and humanity was made. And aren't you glad? Because as a Gentile, there was now a way in for each one of us. But does it mean that salvation is now easy? Is it easy for a Jew to become a Christian? No, it isn't. It's harder for them because they still do not believe that the Messiah has come. It is sad when we see pictures of them and film on the television as they stand at the Wailing Wall in Jerusalem, crying out for the Messiah to come, missing the very fact that it was they themselves who put him to death to bring salvation to everyone. Stan Telchin, in his book, he, he was a Jewish man he was not really a practicing Jew, he confessed. But his daughter went away to college and came home and announced that she'd become a Christian. He was absolutely horrified at this news because for a Jew, it is to be thrown out of the company that you keep, not allowed to be a Jew anymore. And Stan Telchin knew that if he didn't win her back, he would have to send out the death notice. The death notice would be a card in an envelope lined with black announcing the death of a family member. And even though she would be alive, she would be dead to her family and to the Jewish faith. She came home and begged him to look at things from her point of view, to look at the Bible. And he decided that he wanted to do that to win her back. He sat down and read the Gospels and found Jesus Christ. He wrote a book about his findings, but the book is actually called Betrayed because that's what happens when a Jew becomes a Christian. They are betraying their own race. 
I'd just like to share with you what a rabbi actually says about a Jew becoming a Christian. He, he sees it as an attempt for the Jew to divorce himself from the Jewish community and to abandon his heritage. He says that he is forced by Jewish law to say that a Jew who becomes a Christian is still a Jew but he doesn't like it. When a Jew becomes a Christian, he has done a heinous thing in the, in the Jewish faith. He has spit on his grandmother's grave. But he is still a Jew if he is born of a Jewish mother. He has lost all his privileges as a Jew. He cannot marry a Jewish woman. He cannot be buried in a Jewish cemetery, and he better not show up at any services that I'm conducting, said the rabbi. That's a really hard place to be, isn't it? And we should spare a thought and pray for those Jews who have taken that step and seen the truth that Jesus is the Messiah and that he came to save all of humanity. I have been blessed in my life over the last 20 or more years to have had a Messianic Jew as my spiritual father. And he gave his life to Jesus when he was 11. I can honestly tell you that he loved and loves Jesus now with all his heart. He was truly, truly saved. But it is not an easy walk to turn your back on all those rules and regulations and the way that the Jews have lived. In 2015, Ken and I, we did a mad thing in a way, I suppose. In March and April, Ken's birthday's in January and there's nothing much he ever wants. So we did four Wednesdays of going to London, to the theater. We would start off at seven o'clock in the morning, see a matinee, an evening production, and then drive home. And the, yeah, really mad. And the thing about that is that in the theater, I am sitting with Ken on one side and somebody else on the other. And it is one of those somebody else's. We went to see a, um, a musical. It was very much a musical of 70s music, music that we'd grown up with. And Ken really fancied going to see it. I won't tell you its title yet. But as we sat there and it began, the language was unbelievable. I was cringing in my seat. And Ken was looking at me thinking, oh, please don't get up and leave now. Wait until, until the interval. Because he knew that I would not like what I was listening to. My husband doesn't walk with the Lord, but he does know enough to know when I am not happy. <laughs> Halfway through the first half, a man came onto the stage called Brother Joey. And one of the men who was there with them said, why do they call you brother Joey then? So he said, well, when I was in America, I heard the gospel of Jesus Christ and I accepted him as my savior. And I've been called brother Joey ever since. I thought, not bad. So they said, well, why have you come? So he said, God sent me and God blows my trumpet. I thought, this is getting better by the minute. But believe me, that was about the crux of it. The interval came and Ken said to me very quickly, I'm going to the bathroom, and off he went. But I was sitting next to a, a young lady, possibly in her late 20s, early 30s, and as soon as Ken went, she said to me, what do you think of this? So I said, not a lot. I said, the language is awful. I said, you see, I'm like Brother Joey. I too have heard the gospel of Jesus Christ and I have given him my life. And I find this quite offensive. Oh, she said, are you a Christian? So I said, yeah. She said, tell me, how did you become a Christian? 
And so for 20 minutes, I shared the gospel with her of how I became a Christian. And then she said to me, my name's Alexandria. She said, and I have to say to you that the one thing that is really standing out for me is your total dedication to God. And I said, well, that's because God paid the ultimate price in sending his son to save my life. She said, I have a confession to make to you. I am a Jew. But she said, I'm not a good Jew because I'm not practicing my faith. And with that, the lights went out and the second half began. A little way through the second half, the group was named that was being formed to play this music. And Brother Joey called them the commitments. And that's about the only commitment that there was in relation to Jesus, apart from himself, that there was. But we were asked to stand up as if we were in a, a music concert and clap while they prayed. So we all stood up and began to clap. And God said to me, I want you to speak a word to Alexandria. And what God asked me to say to her was, God chose you first. Immediately, she burst into tears and threw her arms around my neck. It took me a little while to realize that the clapping and the music in the theater had stopped because I'm now holding Alexandria. And so when I looked around, we found that we were the only two people still standing up in the stalls. But thankfully, the man who was leading the singing at the time could see that she was crying and he did not make a big fuss. He just quietly said, thank you ladies, you can sit down now. And so we sat down, but the next voice that could be heard was my husband's very loudly saying, were you praying with her then? <laughs> It was quite a moment, I can tell you. After the production finished, Alexandria hugged me and told me that she was glad that we had met and had our conversation. I told her that I would continue to pray for her, that she would find the truth of God for herself. I can't tell you how many times I prayed for in this last fortnight when I knew that I was doing this particular um, preach and, and to be able to share her life. We are called by this morning's message title to relate to one another. How as Christians do we do that? Because here was a Jew that God called me to speak to. I can tell you that every production that we went to, I had a wonderful time talking about Jesus, always with the person on the other side of me, never my husband. But he is used to my ways and he is used to God moving in me. But you know, the, the truth is, as Gentiles, we have been now given a way into the kingdom. So is it easy for, any easier for us to accept God's forgiveness? than a Jew? I would say not. Because salvation is not a free ticket from hell. Neither is it a free pass into heaven. Because it is a complete life change from one way to another. In this passage, Paul told, talks about what life was like for us all before Jesus came and the fact that Jesus became God's sin offering. He became the Lamb of God that was sacrificed so that we could all come into God's kingdom. And this morning, if you are here and you have given your heart to God, you form part of this body of Christ because, you see, these walls are not the church. We are. God doesn't need the walls because Jesus is in each one of us. We are the temple of God. 
but it would be a bit hard, wouldn't it, in the winter if we just stood on the car park outside and got wet when it rained. God is gracious and we do have a church where we can come and gather together. But it's not just about us, is it? There is a world out there that is lost and we are called to communicate God's truth. We are called to share the gospel. Jesus even went so far as to say that if we stop telling about him, that the rocks would cry out. Wouldn't that be dreadful? But the truth is, we carry the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the cornerstone of his church within each one of us. He is the cornerstone in my life. He is in my life by the Holy Spirit. And how do we relate to one another in all of this as his body? Are we caring for one another are we, as we should? Are we looking after the small parts as well as the large? The toes are equally as important as the head. Are we looking to one another in fellowship? We've been singing about being one in God this morning. There is a new time coming for this church. We have a new pastor coming. Are we, as his people, God's people, ready for this new work? Are we committed to each other? Are we praying for one another and looking after each other as we should? The truth is, this coming Saturday, it's the quarterly prayer meeting. Prayer is the powerhouse of the church. But it's not just every quarter. It's every day, every minute we are told to pray without ceasing so that we can go out and share Jesus. It's not easy. And on Thursday mornings here, there is a prayer meeting, which I come to. And in 2016, I was coming out one Thursday morning and Ken said to me, now don't dawdle this morning. After the prayer meeting is finished, I want you to come straight home. He said, we are going out to Hampton Court Palace and I will make the picnic while you're away. So I said, okay. He said, and we may go on into London. I came to the prayer meeting. Marion was leading it that morning because we do take it in turns. We are going through Psalms at the moment and we spend a little time in the <coughs> Word and then we pray together. Marion was very much led by God that morning to come and pray individually with each one of us. She stood in front of us and she laid hands on us and prayed God's blessing into our lives. And then as we parted, I did what Ken said. I went home straight away. But when I got there, he said, we can't go to, to Hampton Court today. So I said, we can't? No, he said, it's too hot. And for those of you who don't know, I live in a caravan, um, a static caravan in Pagham for eight months of the year. But it is a tin box. When it's cold, it's cold sometimes, and when it's hot, it can be really hot. And we have our cat, Millie, who lives with us in the caravan, and Ken felt it would, be, it would warm up too much to leave her on her own in the heat. So he said, we will go instead to Leon Solent and sit on the seafront and enjoy the weather till about, and be back for six when the sun comes onto the front windows and heats the caravan up properly. So we set off and we had a lovely picnic and about half past three, Ken said to me, would you like to go to Gosport and have a look around the shops? Well, I have to say, I thought it was a bit of a trick question at first. <laughs> You see, my husband doesn't usually say, would you like and shop in the same sentence. <laughs> it is alien to him. He does not like it. So I, I thought, well, I'm going to pass this test. <laughs> and I said to him, no, no, no. I'm quite happy to sit here with you, dear. <laughs> oh, well, if you don't want to go, then that's a matter for you. God. There is a tone in my husband's voice that I have come to recognize over the last 37 years as being God. 
speaking through him to me. I would never tell him that because it would give him terrible ideas. But it is a fact that he has this tone and it pulls me up sharp. So I said, okay. I said, I, I accept what you say. I, I, I would really like to go. I said, I just didn't want you to think that shopping was more important than you. I wouldn't have said it if I didn't mean it. So I said, right, we'll go. We traveled to Gosport, and by the time we got there, he was his usual self. You have one hour. Be back by five o'clock. So off I went. Now, I had a feeling that God had brought me to Gosport. So I began to pray, and as I wandered around the shops, Nothing seemed to be happening. But at 20 to 5, I walked into a shop. I was looking for a pair of shorts, by the way. And a lady was standing by the till, holding court. She was telling everyone their character by their star sign. She was telling them their personality and character. And she had quite an audience. So I began to pray, quietly within myself. And very soon, I found the shorts. And so I went to the till, and a voice behind me said, so what star sign are you then? I turned round, and I said, I am a Christian. I don't follow the stars, I follow the Son of God. Well, what month were you born then? So I said, I'm not going to tell you that, because if I do, you'll work out my star sign, and I don't want to be involved. Well, I'll guess anyway. Looking at you, I'll say you're a Sagittarius. She was completely wrong. But she decided that this is what I was, and I said, please, I said, I've told you, I'm a Christian, and I don't follow the stars. Ooh, you're getting all defensive now because you're a Christian, are you? So I said, no, I'm not being defensive. I am a born-again Christian, and I follow the Lord. A voice at the side of me said, ooh, my gran was a born-again Christian, and she used to take me to church, but she died and I've been too afraid to go since, in case I make it about her and not about God. The lady who was busy with the star signs then said to me, I've changed my mind. You're not Sagittarius. You've got nice eyes. People with nice eyes are usually Scorpio. She was right. I was flabbergasted and I said, I really don't want to do this. So she said, okay, do you believe then that horoscopes are satanic? So I said, well, as you've asked me, yes, I do. I said, they are against everything of God. And as a Christian who believes that Jesus has died for me and that God is my father, I have no need to go to anyone else except him. You'd be surprised how many of the people who'd been listening to their characters about horoscopes pricked up their ears when they heard that this was not of God at all. So she said, all right then, what does it mean to be a born again Christian? So I told her how Jesus had come to pay the price for all mankind and to die on the cross. Oh, she said, I do wish that I could have that in my life. You see, when you take people, Jesus to people, things happen. Before I had a chance to say anything more than other than, well, you can, her forehead dropped on my shoulder and she began to cry. But this wasn't a gentle crying. This was heart-wrenching sobbing. It filled the shock. And after a couple of minutes, she said to me, I'm so angry with God. So I said, well, you better tell him about it. And she did, loudly. After she'd finished, I prayed with her. And she looked up at me and she said, I'm not angry with God anymore. 
but I am really angry with my dad. So I said, do you want to tell me about it? She said my dad was terminally ill, but he never told me. I said, well, that was a really sad thing to happen to you. Oh, she said, that's not the half of it. She said, my dad always called a spade a spade. He said, this life is all you have. And when you're dead, you're dead. There's nothing else, nothing at all. And she said, do you know what he did? So I said, no. A week before he died, he turned Catholic. <laughs> so I said, did he? She said, I spoke to the priest about it. And he said, they do it just in case, for insurance, just in case there is something after. And I said, well, as you've heard, all he really had to do was turn to Jesus Christ. As I prayed with her again about the hurt that she'd suffered, I became aware, as I said, amen, that the young girl whose grandma was a Christian was now crying at the side of me. I learned her name was Rebecca. The one I was praying with was Jill. So I said, would you like me to pray with you? My newfound friend, Jill, said to Becky, oh, do let her pray with you, Becky. You'll feel so much better if you do. And so I held her in my arms and I prayed with her. At the end of the prayer, something remarkable happened. The woman who was so against God put her arms around Becky and said, don't you be frightened about going to church, she said, or the fact that you've got to go on your own because I will come with you and we'll go this Sunday. My work was done. I had taken Jesus to them and he had touched them where they were because that's what witnessing is about. It's not about going out into the world and making people like us. It's the last thing that Jesus wants, and it's the last thing I would want to make anyone like me. But when we take Jesus out of these four walls and into the world and the community, he does wonderful things when he meets people where they are. It's what he did in the Gospels. When he went to the wedding at Cana, he met them at the place where there was no wine and he turned the water into wine. And right through the Gospels, Jesus went to the people where they were. Three weeks after this meeting, Ken and I went to Worthing. Once again, I was given my customary hour to go around the shops. And I went into one of the department stores and I was waiting to be served at a counter. The lady behind the counter was talking with a group of others who were there, and she turned to me and she said, so what star sign are you then? <laughs> I thought, I've been here before, Lord. So I told her the same, that I was a Christian and that I didn't follow the stars, I followed the sun. She said, well, I'm a Christian. So she said, who said it's wrong? So I said, well, actually, it's in the Bible, if you've read the Bible. I said, it will tell you that we are to stay away from those things. <gasps> I'm going to spend so long in purgatory because I didn't know. I'm a Catholic, and that's where I'll end up. So I said, not if you turn to Jesus, because with him there is no purgatory. And that's the thing, isn't it? People think that they will end up in a place where they will have to do time, as it were, for the things that they've done wrong. And the truth is, it's a simple choice. The road that they're on to carry on, or the road to God through Christ. The one who tore down the dividing wall between us and the world. There is no wall anymore. Jesus' unity is what counts as we walk this world. Her name was Fiona. I shared the gospel with her. Last year, I met her again twice, 
And both times she was going through hard times, I was invited behind her counter to pray with her. She cried both times. As I was leaving to go home for the winter, I shared with her about Nicodemus and Jesus and about her need to make that step, that being a Catholic was not enough. She told me she was going to go home and read that passage. But before I left, I said, oh, you seem to have lost one of the other girls. Yes, she said, there's a new lady come to work on the counter. And guess what? Her mum and dad are both born again Christians. And they come in and chat. And I've been able to tell about you. And you see, we always think, don't we, we've got to notch up people on that cross for Jesus. Everyone we bring up, bring into the kingdom is a notch for God. It's not like that. God is fully able to bring those that he is calling without us. The fact that he uses us is a real blessing in our lives. This year, I went about three weeks ago and I saw Fiona, but it was a big event at the store and she was busy. A woman was standing at the side of me who turned to me and said, could you tell me the time, please? I've left my watch at home. Ten minutes later, I was praying with her about her life. You see, God puts us in places where we can share him. To be able to relate to the people who are lost is a great gift of Jesus Christ in our lives. And we cannot afford to miss that. We are his church. Every single one of us is blessed in him. How can we ever ignore the lost? How can we ever be self-satisfied with our own salvation? After Jesus came and tore down the dividing walls, which meant that we as Gentile people could be accepted into the beloved of God. Shall we pray? Lord Jesus, we thank you that you came. You came to die for each and every one of the world's humanity. No matter what the sin or crime, you paid the price. And so, Lord, we look to you today that as your body, you will live and move in each one of us and that you will do the works through us that you've called us to do. For your word tells us that we have be been created in you to do good works works that you have planned for each one of us. Help us, Lord, to support each other, to be there for one another, to pray with one another, to hold each other up before you, and give us the boldness and the courage to go out and share you with the people we meet, but to bring you to them where they are is the greatest gift of all. And so we thank you that you opened our eyes to the truth and that you opened our eyes to the love of God for each one of us. The God who said that I love you so much that I will send my son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. We thank you for that promise this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.